might I begin by thanking Prime Minister Kishida for his excellent speech uh, yesterday, for the honor he gave the Shangri-La Dialogue by attending it last night, given his particularly busy uh, domestic political schedule and his recently nearly hyperactive international set of obligations. And uh, all of you who heard that speech uh, will have also heard uh, of many of Japan's uh, plans moving into next year uh, and into their uh, G7 presidency. The full text of his remarks uh, are available or shortly will be on our web page, both in their original Japanese and in English. Uh, one or two housekeeping remarks before I introduce our keynote um, first plenary session speaker. Um, those are that the remarks made uh, from the podium here during plenaries are on the record. Uh, the questions asked from the floor are equally uh, on the record. That's a discipline that applies not just to the speaker, but to the questioner. So keep your own reputation in mind as well when you are uh, taking the floor, as what you say might also be noted. Please keep your questions or comments brief. 60 seconds is a, a good punchy uh, guideline that also uh, can invite uh, a usefully crisp uh, response. Uh, we have our normal system in operation here and a reminder uh, that the way it uh, should work is that if you put your uh, badge uh, into uh, the microphone uh, slot, uh, the chip on it will recognize uh, who you are. And then you need to press uh, the speak button uh, to register your request to ask a question. Your mic will then turn green, but don't be intimidated by that. That doesn't mean your microphone is actually on. Uh, it just means that I should be able to see you on my screen here. And instead of saying uh, the person in the yellow tie in row 22, um, I can actually um, say your name and provide also uh, your nationality. Uh, no other data is stored on our bar chips, but this helps uh, for speed and efficiency. In the event which is possible that uh, the system might not work perfectly, uh, do raise your hand and a microphone will come uh, very quickly uh, to you. Uh, by tradition, since uh, 2003, uh, the opening speaker uh, on Saturday morning in plenary number one of the IISS Shangri-La Dialogue is always the U.S. Secretary uh, of Defense. Every U.S. Secretary of Defense since 2003, without exception, has uh, graced the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, with his presence. And it's always been a time in the year, typically, uh, when an important statement on Indo-Pacific security uh, is made by the U.S. Secretary of Defense. For me, it is, uh, again, a wonderful pleasure to uh, be able to welcome uh, Lloyd Austin to a IISS uh, event. He has uh, great form uh, at the IISS, having attended at CENTCOM Commander a few of our uh, Manama dialogues and having now attended both the Manama and the Shangri-La Dialogues as uh, Secretary of Defense. Uh, he is uh, a person of uh, wide and uh, deep experience in, in defense issues. And as I was mentioning informally to one of our colleagues uh, yesterday, uh, when you are a theater commander, uh, about 80% of your work could be said to be defense diplomacy with the allies, partners, uh, or potential uh, allies and partners uh, in the region. So this is uh, a, a theme uh, that is dear to the Shangri-La dialogue and one which uh, Lloyd Austin is um, Im impeccably uh, prepared to speak uh, on. So his title is Next Steps for the United States Indo-Pacific Strategy. Lloyd Austin, the floor is yours. Right. Thank you very much.
Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be back in Singapore. I was here in July of 2021 to give the double uh, I double S Fullerton lecture. So, John, I'm starting to feel like a regular. <laughs> but in all seriousness, uh, thanks for having me back. I also want to thank John for everything that double I double S does to promote dialogue in this region. And I want to thank our national host, Singapore, for providing such a warm welcome for all of us. It's especially good to see Senior Minister Teo, Minister Ung, and Minister Balakrishnan. Now, this is my first time to formally address a Shangri-La Dialogue as Secretary of Defense. And I'm glad to have the chance to discuss many of my government's policies, but I'm also here to listen and to have some honest discussions. Now, the simple fact that this dialogue is back in person is absolutely encouraging. When I was here last year, my speech was one of the first public gatherings in Singapore as it was starting to reopen after the terrible early months of the pandemic. So going from one long keynote to this bustling in-person dialogue suggests the strides that this region has made. Now that's a great tribute to Prime Minister Lee and our hosts from Singapore. And Singapore has also helped others around the world recover. It's worked around the clock to produce life-saving medical supplies, including test kits and ventilators and protective gear. And the United States is deeply committed to getting the whole world past this pandemic. Since March of 2020, we have provided more than $19 billion worldwide to produce and deliver vaccines and to spur global recovery. We're proud to be the world's single largest donor of vaccines. And we've pledged to distribute more than 1.2 billion vaccine doses worldwide before this year is out. We've already distributed more than half a billion doses, and we won't let up. We're deeply committed to helping this region heal, recover, and rebuild, because that's just what a friend does. And let's face it, this pandemic has hit all of us where we live. It upended all of our lives. It left tragedy and disruption in its wake. But today, we stand together at a moment that carries the promise of renewal. And I hope that we'll all come out of the pandemic with a broader perspective on what lasting security means in the 21st century. Now, the last time that I was in Singapore, the theme of my speech was the power of partnership. And so today I want to talk about what that has meant in action, about how our partnerships have grown even stronger, and about how we've moved together toward our shared vision for the region. The journey that we've made together in the past year only underscores a basic truth. In today's interwoven world, we're stronger when we find ways to come together. And as we do so, we know that most countries across the Indo-Pacific share a common vision and our people share common dreams. Over the past decade, our allies and partners across the region have written core elements of this vision. Take Prime Minister Kashida, who has called for, quote, a free and open order based on the rule of law, not might. 
And last month, at the first ever U.S. ASEAN Special Summit in Washington, the United States and our ASEAN partners declared our enduring commitment to the principles of, quote, an open, inclusive, and rules-based regional architecture. And the Quad leaders echoed that commitment at their own summit less than two weeks later. That means a shared re belief in transparency. It also means a dedication to openness and accountability. It means a commitment to freedom of the seas, skies, and space. And it means an insistence that disputes be resolved peacefully. We seek a region free of aggression and bullying. And we seek a world that respects territorial integrity and political independence. A world that expands human rights and human dignity. And a world in which all countries, large and small, are free to thrive and to lawfully pursue their interests, free from coercion and intimidation. Now, we know the riptides that we face, from COVID to cyber threats to nuclear proliferation. And we feel the headwinds from threats and intimidation and the obsolete belief in a world carved up into spheres and influence. Now, we are confident that we can steer forward, but we can only do it together. We all know the challenges that this region faces, the pandemic, climate change, nuclear threats from North Korea, coercion by larger states against their smaller neighbors, and cruelty and violence from the, from the regime in Myanmar, and threats in the gray zone. These challenges demand shared responsibility and common action. And we must all reaffirm our common commitment to uphold international law, defend global norms, and oppose unilateral changes to the status quo. You know, just last month, President Biden was in the region to reaffirm that these principles matter. And he was also here to underscore the depth of American commitment to the security and the prosperity of the Indo-Pacific. That commitment has grown over the years. And it is now the core organizing principle of American national security policy. Today, the Indo-Pacific is our priority theater of operations. Today, the Indo-Pacific is at the heart of American grand strategy. And today, senior American officials, including the President, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, and so many others travel constantly in this region. And today, American statecraft is rooted in this reality. No region will do more to set the trajectory of the 21st century than this one. And so the Indo-Pacific is our center of strategic gravity. And that's central to the Biden administration's forthcoming national security strategy and to my department's national defense strategy. And it's why the first regional strategy that the Biden administration released was our Indo-Pacific strategy. As President Biden said in May in Tokyo, the United States is deeply invested in the Indo-Pacific. We're committed for the long haul, ready to champion our vision for a positive future for the region with our friends and partners. You know, that future will be written not by any one country, 
but by all the peoples of the Indo-Pacific. And I'm proud that our unparalleled network of alliances and partnerships has only deepened since the last time that I was in Singapore. We've achieved an extraordinary amount in the past 11 months. And that progress is rooted in working together. You see it in the region's effort to recover from the pandemic. And you see it in the rapid development of the Quad and in our new trilateral AUKUS security partnership. You see it in the launch of new climate resilience efforts with ASEAN and in our close partnership with Pacific Island countries. You see it in new opportunities for cooperation among Japan, the Republic of Korea, and more. And in renewed complex military exercises that deepen our interoperability and strengthen the region's security. But not all the news in the past year has been good. So I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss the historic crisis caused by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Russia's indefensible assault on a peaceful neighbor has galvanized the world. And Putin's reckless war of choice has reminded us all of the dangers of undercutting an international order rooted in rules and respect. So we're meeting today at a moment of great consequence for the whole world and not just for Europe. President Biden has been clear about the stakes. And the Ukraine crisis poses some urgent questions for us all. Do rules matter? Does sovereignty matter? Does the system that we have built together matter? I'm here because I believe that it does. And I'm here because the rules-based international order matters just as much in the Indo-Pacific as it does in Europe. Now, our friends and partners also know that. And they understand that smaller countries have a right to peacefully resolve disputes with their larger neighbors. And that's why Australia, Japan, New Zealand, the Republic of Korea and others have rushed security assistance to Ukraine. And it's why countries across this region have sped humanitarian aid to the, to, to the suffering pe Ukrainian people, including vital contributions from Singapore, Thailand, India, and Vietnam. So let's be clear. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is what happens when oppressors trample the rules that protect us all. It's what happens when big powers decide that their imperial appetites matter more than the rights of their peaceful neighbors. And it's a preview of a possible world of chaos and turmoil that none of us would want to live in. So we understand what we could lose. We see the dangers of disorder. So let's use this moment to come together in common purpose. Let's use this moment to strengthen the rules-based international order. And let's use this moment to think about the future that we all want. That's really why I'm here today. The United States stands firmly beside our partners to ensure that we continue moving towards that shared vision. And we will continue to do our part to strengthen security in the Indo-Pacific. You know, more members of the U.S. military are stationed here than in any other part of the world. 
more than 300,000 of our men and women. The President's fiscal year 2023 budget makes one of the largest investments in history to preserve this region's security. And that includes $6.1 billion for our Pacific Deterrence Initiative, which will strengthen multilateral information sharing and support training and experimentation with our partners. To stay at the cutting edge, we must invest in innovation across all domains, including space and cyberspace. So we recently made the department's largest ever budget request for research and development, more than $130 billion. Meanwhile, we're working hard to develop new capabilities that will allow us to deter aggression even more surely, including stealth aircraft, unmanned platforms, and long-range precision fires. And we're on the cusp of delivering prototypes for high-energy lasers that can counter missiles. And we're developing integrated sensors that operate at the intersection of cyber, EW, and radar communications. And so all of this helps us to do even, even more to stand shoulder to shoulder with our friends. Our security alliances and partnerships in the Indo-Pacific are a profound source of stability. So our integrated deterrence in the region will continue to center on our ties with our proud treaty allies, Australia, Japan, the Philippines, South Korea, and Thailand. And we remain unwavering in our mutual defense commitments. At the same time, we're, weaving, we're also weaving closer ties with other partners. And I'm especially thinking of India, the world's largest democracy. We believe that its growing military capability and technological prowess can be a stabilizing force in the region. And we're taking our defense cooperation with Singapore, Indonesia, and Vietnam to the next level. In the past year, my belief in the strategic power of partnerships has only deepened. And that's at the heart of, President Biden, uh, of, of, of the President's Indo-Pacific strategy. Our work together helps ensure that all countries in the region, large and small, have a say in its future. It helps ensure that the status quo can't be disrupted in, in ways that harm all of our security and it helps strengthen our ability to find common solutions to common challenges. So I wanted to highlight three key ways in which we've been working together with our friends and partners over the past year, and how that's bringing us closer to our shared vision, shared vision for this region's future. First, we're working with our partners and allies to ensure that they have the right capabilities to defend their interests and to deter aggression and to thrive on their own terms. Now, as we invest in innovation in America, we're committed to bringing our allies and partners along with us. And that means sharing the fruits of our R&D success. So we're working with our friends to link our defense industrial bases, to integrate our supply chains, and even co-produce some key technologies. Last year, the department launched the Rapid Defense Experimentation Reserve to quickly get promising technology and prototypes into the hands of our warfighters. And we're working even more closely with trusted partners as we test game-changing techno game technologies together. And that's another reason why our new security partnership with Australia and the UK is so important. AUKUS won't just deliver nuclear-powered submarines. It holds a promise of progress across a range of emerging tech areas that can bolster our deterrence, 
from AI to hypersonics. Emerging technology is crucial to prosperity also. To maintain the region's access to this sort of critical technology, we need to keep its supply chains secure. And that's central to our new Indo-Pacific economic framework, which President Biden recently launched with 12 partners from across the region, including many partners here in Southeast Asia. Now, I'm also very proud of our progress with our partners this past year in a second important area. And that area is exercises and training. That expands our common readiness, it deepens our interoperability, and it helps defend the principles that we share. So we've stepped up the complexity, the jointness, and the scale of our combined exercises with our allies and partners. Take our keen sword exercises with Japan, which this year used existing and emerging tech, uh, capabilities in a far more integrated manner. Or take our Talisman Sabre exercise with Australia, which was joined last time by Canada, Japan, New Zealand, the UK, and for the first time, the Republic of Korea. In April, the United States and the Philippines held our annual Balakatan exercise. It was our 37th time and the largest and most, most complex iteration involving some 9,000 troops. And last spring, the USS Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group rotated through the Indian Ocean. And we conducted simultaneous joint operations with the Indian Navy and the Indian Air Force at integrated air power and anti-submarine warfare. We're also finding new ways for our friends to operate together and looking for new constellations of partners including good friends from Europe and beyond. Just think of La Perouse, an exercise last spring with navies from Australia, France, India, and Japan. Or consider Garuda Shield, our annual bi bilateral exercise with Indonesia. And this August, for the first time, we're expanding it. It will now include a total of 14 participating countries, including Australia, Canada, Japan, and Singapore. And later this month, we'll host the 28th iteration of RIMPAC. Forces from 26 countries with 38 ships and nearly 25,000 personnel will gather along U.S. shores for the world's largest naval exercise. Now, we're also working more closely with our partners in ways that aren't quite so visible. And that includes tackling gray zone actions that chip away at international laws and norms. And we're bringing, the full, we're bringing to bear the full resources of the U.S. government to do so. And that includes unprecedented Coast Guard investments in the Indo-Pacific. And I'm proud to say that the Coast Guard's new outstanding commandant, Admiral Linda Fagan, is here with us in Singapore and within her first two weeks on the job, that I might add. You know, it's the first time that a U.S. Coast Guard commandant has joined us at the Shangri-La Dialogue. And it's a sign of how important Southeast Asia is to the Coast Guard. Next year, our Coast Guard will also deploy a cutter to Southeast Asia in Oceania. And that will open up new opportunities for multinational crewing, training, and cooperation across the region. And it will be the first major U.S. Coast Guard cutter permanently stationed in the region. And that brings me to a third important aspect of our common efforts to defend our shared principles. More and more, we're working in new and flexible and custom-made ways with our friends. 
And our partners are doing the same thing with one another. Even as we strengthen our commitment to ASEAN centrality and its leading place in the regional architecture. And that's meant the rise of nimble and flexible security networks that add stability to the region. You see this trend in new important, important new discussions about regional security, with different groups of partners talking together about shared challenges and working together in new ways. Since 2015, Australia, India, and Japan have been holding security dialogues about maritime security cooperation. In just the past few months, Japan and the Philippines launched a new 2 plus 2 dialogue. And so did Australia and India. Our trilateral defense cooperation with Australia and Japan remains pivotal. And we continue to integrate our three militaries in key areas. I was also glad to attend the ADMM Plus last year. And I look forward to meeting with ASEAN defense ministers again this fall. And meanwhile, over the past 18 months, we've helped to bring new vigor to the Quad. That includes a third Quad Leaders Summit last month, bringing together four of the region's largest, largest producers of prosperity and security. And as the Quad Leaders have noted, they are eager to work with ASEAN and the Pacific Islands to advance our shared goals. We're also working together to make the region's security architecture more transparent and more inclusive. So think of the new Indo-Pacific Partnership for Maritime Domain Awareness, which President Biden announced in Tokyo last month. Now, this important initiative aims to provide better access to space-based and maritime domain awareness to countries across the region, including here in Southeast Asia. And this new partnership will harness uh, together regional information centers that will help us build a common operating picture and work together to tackle illegal fishing and other gray zone activities. In today's interconnected world, we're also seeing new ways to support our European security partners, uh, growing engagement in the Indo-Pacific. So we'll keep expanding our consultations with European countries on regional security issues. And we'll deepen and widen the dialogue and cooperation among NATO and our core Indo-Pacific allies. You know, several of our European allies have been deploying to the Indo-Pacific and operating alongside our partners here in unprecedented ways. The United Kingdom made history last year with its deployment of the HMS Queen Elizabeth as part of a multinational carrier strike group that included a U.S. destroyer, an American Marine Corps F-35 squadron, and so it was a significant accomplishment. Such deployments send a message of strength and stability. And that's deeply important for all the peoples of the region. And it's especially important given the challenges to security and stability in the Indo-Pacific. As our national security, national defense strategy notes, we all face a persistent threat from North Korea. The United States will stand ready, always stand ready, to deter aggression and to uphold our treaty commitments to the, and, and the will of the UN Security Council. North Korea's habitual provocations and missile tests only underscore the urgency of our task. And so we're deepening the security cooperation among the United States, Japan, and the Republic of Korea. Together, we will continue to strengthen our extended deterrence against nuclear arms and ballistic missile systems. And we remain open to future diplomacy and fully prepared to deter and to, and to defeat future aggression. 
We'll also stand by our friends as they uphold their rights. And that's especially important as the PRC adopts a more coercive and aggressive approach to its territorial claims. In the East China Sea, the PRC's expanding fishing fleet is sparking tensions with its neighbors. In the South China Sea, the PRC is using outposts on man-made islands bristling with advanced weaponry to advance its illegal maritime claims. We're seeing PRC vessels plunder the region's provisions operating illegally within the territorial waters of other Indo-Pacific Indo countries. And further to the west, we see Beijing continue to harden its position along the border that it shares with India. You know, Indo-Pacific countries shouldn't face political intimidation, economic coercion, or harassment by maritime militias. So the Department of Defense will maintain our active presence across the Indo-Pacific. We will continue to support the 2016 Arbitral Trib Tribunal ruling, and we will fly, sail, and operate wherever international law allows. And we'll do this right alongside our partners. And we'll continue to be candid about the challenges that we all face. You know, we've seen an alarming increase in the number of unsafe aerial intercepts and confronta confrontations at sea by PLA, PLA aircraft and vessels. In February, a PLA Navy ship directed a laser at an Australian P-8 maritime patrol aircraft, ser seriously endangering everyone on board. And in the past few weeks, <coughs> PLA fighters have conducted a series of dangerous intercepts of Allied aircraft operating lawfully in the East China and South China Seas. Now, this should worry us all. And the stakes are especially stark in the Taiwan Strait. Our policy is unchanged and unwavering. It has been consistent across administrations. And we are determined to uphold the status quo that has served this region so well for so long. So let me be clear. We remain firmly committed to our long-standing One China policy, guided by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint communiques, and the six assurances. We categorically oppose any unilateral changes to the status quo from either side. And we do not support Taiwan independence. And we stand firmly behind the principle that cross-strait differences must be resolved by peaceful means. Now, as a part of our One China policy, we will continue to fulfill our commitments under the Taiwan Relations Act. And that includes assisting Taiwan in maintaining a sufficient self-defense capability. And it means maintaining our own capacity to resist any use of force or other forms of coercion that would jeopardize the security or the social or economic system of the people of Taiwan. So our policy hasn't changed. But unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be true for the PRC. As my friend Secretary of State Blinken has also noted, we see growing coercion from Beijing. We've witnessed a steady increase in provocative and destabilizing military activity near Taiwan. And that includes PLA aircraft flying near Taiwan in record numbers in recent months, and nearly on a daily basis. And we remain focused on maintaining peace, stability, and the status quo across, across the Taiwan Strait. But the PRC's moves threaten to undermine security and stability and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. And that's crucial for this region. 
and is crucial for the wider world. Maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait isn't just a U.S. interest. It's a matter, matter of international concern. So let me be clear. We do not seek confrontation or conflict. And we do not seek a new Cold War, an Asian NATO, or a region split into hostile blocks. We will defend our interests without flinching. But we'll also work toward our vision for this region, one of expanding security, one of increased uh, uh, cooperation, and not one of growing division. And I continue to believe that big powers carry big responsibilities. And so we will do our part to manage these tensions responsibly and to prevent conflict and to pursue peace and prosperity. And as I said in Singapore last year, great powers should be models of transparency and communication. So we're working closely with both our competitors and our friends to strengthen the guardrails against conflict. And that includes fully open lines of communication with China's defense leaders to ensure that we can avoid any miscalculations. And these are deeply, deeply important conversations. The United States is fully committed to doing our part. And that's why I'm here today. I am proud of our commitment to this region. I'm proud of our unmatched and unrivaled network of allies and partners. I'm proud of our commitment to openness and human dignity. You know, in recent decades, we've become even more inclusive in our approach to the Indo-Pacific. We've expanded our cooperation with our allies and partners, and we've worked in tandem with new and existing regional institutions. And all of that builds new habits of cooperation across this region. And it builds on old friendships in the Indo-Pacific, going back for many, many decades. We seek inclusion, not division. We seek cooperation and not strife. And that means we're following the wise counsel from Prime Minister Lee, who argues that nobody should force binary choices on the region. He's right. Our fellow Indo-Pacific nations should be free to choose, free to prosper, and free to chart their own course. Ladies and gentlemen, this region has already cast its vote on what kind of a future it seeks. It's an interconnected and optimistic future, one rooted in the rule of law and a profound commitment to freedom and openness. And it's a future that we can only make real by working together. As President Kennedy put it back in 1962, quote, acting on our own by ourselves, we cannot establish justice throughout the world or provide for its common defense or promote its general welfare. But joined with other free nations, we can do all this and more. And ultimately, we can help to achieve a world of law and of free choice, banishing the world of war and coercion. Now that's a vision worth working for. It's a vision grounded in the best traditions of the United States. And it's a vision that reaches for the highest aspirations for the Indo-Pacific. We don't believe that this vision can be imposed. But we do believe that it can be achieved by working together, by listening to one another, and by acting as good friends and good neighbors, and by, again, showing the world 
the power of partnership. It's great to be here with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. That's one of the strongest statements we've heard from this uh, podium, a clear declaration that American strategy is rooted in the Indo-Pacific, which is the center of gravity of its strategic effort, a specific uh, assertion that sharing the fruits of your R&D success with allies and partners and testing game-changing technologies with each other is an important priority. And I think everybody will have taken note also of your concluding remark that no country should be forced uh, to make binary choices. Thank you very much for that and all the other things that were in your uh, remarks. I have a number of people who've asked the floor and I'll turn to them in a group shortly. I just want to ask the Secretary one question before I go back to the floor so we uh, deal with that other uh, issue in the world that is now occupying so many people's minds. Uh, Secretary Austin, when you were in CENTCOM, one of your big uh, uh, duties was to ensure that the Straits of Hormuz would be open so that oil could flow uh, through it. And indeed, often it was argued that uh, America's Middle East strategy was linked to its Indo-Pacific strategy because without being able to keep the Straits of Hormuz open, Asians wouldn't be able to benefit from the oil that was produced and sold from there. Now in the Black Sea, uh, you have 22 million tons of grains, many of which will be going to countries in this region, or should be going, for example, to uh, Indonesia, and as a consequence of the war, the Black Sea is effectively closed. There are many efforts of negotiation with Russia and Ukraine and others to seek a way to opening that. But given that that's such an important humanitarian necessity, can you envision a role for navies and the military to support the humanitarian effort to ensure that uh, humanitarian traffic grains can flow from the ports in the Black Sea uh, to other places in the world? Well, let me, let me just say that uh, th this is a very important I issue and one that leaders uh, in the region and across the globe are focused on. Um, when you ask whether or not uh, the mil our militaries of the region and of the world can add value, of course we can. Uh, but you know, we would always want to seek a, a diplomatic solution first, and I, I see uh, a lot of energy uh, in, that, uh, in that area ongoing as we speak. And we would hope that, uh, that the right things uh, happen. You know, but it, this, this didn't have to happen. We are here because of the choice of one man, the choice of Vladimir Putin. Uh, he, uh, he chose to invade his neighbor, you know, it, unprovoked invasion. Uh, this was, uh, it was not based on any kind of, uh, any kind of logic or reason. Uh, and we see the consequences of, uh, of actions like that. And so I think that's, uh, that reminds us of how important the rules-based international order is. So. I'll turn to the floor, take three or four in a group. First, uh, from the Republic of Korea, uh, Chung Min Lee. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. My question to you is, as we speak, Russian and Chinese bombers are intruding into Korean and Japanese air uh, defense identification zones. And as a result, one of the reasons why, at the end of this month, at the Madrid summit, the leaders of Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand will be participating in NATO summit for the first time. What can your close allies do here in the region to augment European security and vice versa? Thank you very much. If you like to. I didn't hear the end of that. What could that we do to... Go ahead. My question was, what can your four closest allies do in the region to augment European security because the leaders of Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand will be participating in the NATO summit in Madrid this June? Well, it, I mean, there's, uh, first of all, uh, countries from this region, as you heard me say earlier, have been very supportive of, uh, of the effort uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, thus far. They've uh, provided, uh, a number of countries have provided uh, security assistance and, and other countries have provided humanitarian assistance and, and this is very, very important. Uh, you've seen me uh, pull together uh, ministers of defense uh, from across the globe, quite frankly, 
uh, to focus on uh, those things that we can do uh, to continue to help uh, Ukraine as it struggles to, uh, to defend uh, its sovereign territory. And I say struggle, but, but quite frankly, we're all proud of the work that the Ukrainians have done. Uh, and they are absolutely inspiring in terms of uh, their, their commitment to their democracy, their will to defend their land. Uh, and I think there's uh, there are great lessons to be learned from, uh, from, from that for all of us in terms of uh, their commitment. Uh, but, but again, I will host another uh, one of those meetings uh, in about a week as I go to Brussels. Uh, and we started out with 40 countries contributing uh, capability. Uh, it grew the next meeting to 47 countries, and now it's over 50 countries. Uh, and that shows you how, how much uh, the global community uh, cares about, uh, about this issue and how much uh, uh, countries around the world want, want to help Ukraine in its, uh, in its effort to defend its sovereign territory. Thanks very much. And next from the U.S., Bonnie Glazer, if you can put up your hand as well. Uh, it looks like your microphone is working. Go ahead. Bonnie. Thank you, Secretary Austin. Um, the most dangerous potential conflict in the Indo-Pacific is a war in the Taiwan Strait that would arise from a Chinese attempt to seize Taiwan by force. And President Biden has recently said, repeated actually, that he would defend Taiwan if attacked. What are the steps that the United States, our allies, and Taiwan need to take to bolster deterrence so that peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait can be preserved? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Barney. Um, first of all, uh, you've heard me say and, and heard a number, of our a number of our leaders, senior leaders, say that uh, we think that uh, any unilateral change to the status quo uh, is, uh, would be unwelcome and, and ill-advised. Uh, I would just highlight that our policy on uh, Taiwan has not changed. Uh, we remain uh, committed to uh, uh, one China policy, uh, and, uh, and we also remain committed to uh, providing Taiwan with the military means to defend, it, defend itself in accordance with the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, and so I know that countries across the region and across the globe are really uh, focused on this issue, but I, I really, as I said in, the, in, my, in my remarks here, really want to highlight that our uh, Taiwan policy has not changed. So. And from the Philippines, again, put your hand up, Jeffrey Ordinell, but it looks like your microphone is working, so go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, when China started building artificial islands in the South China Sea, the United States said that there would be consequences. China completed those artificial islands. Um, the United States also said that there would be consequences if China militarized those islands. China militarized those islands anyway, stationing uh, bombers and fighter jets. So I guess many of us here are curious, what will be different in the Biden administration's approach to the South China Sea? Because it seems that the current policy is not working, or at least not changing the behavior of China. Thank you. Yeah, so some of the consequences that we've seen is that we, we've seen allies and partners uh, grow closer together and, and work together in a more deliberate way on, uh, to make sure that they, they have the ability to protect their interests uh, and their territorial waters. Uh, and, I see, and, and we've seen, uh, again, in the last uh, couple of years, uh, bonds continue to strengthen. Uh, we've also seen, uh, you know, like-minded uh, countries uh, bond together to, to create new capabilities. So the effect has been that, uh, that it, it's had an effect, that there are some consequences, and those consequences are a much more uh, united uh, uh, region, a, a region that's focused uh, ever so much more on on uh, a vision of uh, free and, Indo and, free and uh, open Indo-Pacific. So, so I, think, uh, I think there have been consequences. And next from Singapore, Lynn Kwok. Go ahead. Thank, <clears throat> Thank you, John. Thank you, Secretary Austin. 
Um, yesterday, Prime Minister Kashida cautioned that Ukraine today may be East Asia tomorrow. Do you share the Japanese Prime Minister's uh, concern, and if so, why? Would it be because of a general sense that um, Ukraine reminds us that war anywhere is possible and we should not be complacent? Or perhaps because um, the United States has concrete concerns that China is like Russia because both are autocracies and will therefore act like it? I would say, I would think it's the former that, uh, you know, uh, anything is possible, and so, I mean, there's a reason that we have, uh, uh, the, you know, militaries to, to defend our sovereign territory, uh, and so we need to be mindful of the fact that uh, those, uh, those militaries, the, our defenses, need, uh, need the right kinds of capabilities. Um, I go back to uh, what I, the questions that I asked earlier. Do rules matter? Does sovereignty matter? You know, is this rules-based international order important to us? Well, I think the answer to that question is yes. I think it's, it's been remarkable to see the global response uh, as a result of Russia's uh, unprovoked uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, there's strong indication ac across this globe, around this globe, that, that uh, countries uh, around the globe truly value the international rules-based order and adherence to that order. So I think there's a, there's a powerful lesson there. So. Front Stefan Gatti, last question. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you mentioned game-changing technologies in your speech. Um, could you perhaps elaborate what technology specifically you have in mind here? And furthermore, do you foresee any changes in U.S. force posture in the region as a result of these game-changing technologies in the near to medium term. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ron Stefan. No, I, I won't go into any detail on, uh, on, uh, on emerging technologies, only to say that, you know, we continue to invest uh, a substantial amount of our, our budget, our defense budget. You heard me say 130, uh, $130 billion uh, dedicated to uh, uh, RDT and E research and development. Uh, we uh, we believe that in order to remain relevant, we have to make sure that we're investing in the right kinds of things to support the operational concepts that we think are important uh, in any conflict uh, in, that that will employ in any conflict uh, going forward. Uh, I would just say that it's important for us to continue to work with our allies and partners as we develop these technologies. Uh, and uh, you heard me commit to doing that in my remarks. Uh, and we're serious about that, and so, uh, but I, I don't, uh, I won't elaborate on any of the specific technologies uh, in this forum. So we've closed this session according to our clock with two seconds remaining. I want to thank you very much, uh, Secretary Austin, and also to say that we should actually draw comfort uh, from the fact that you can't say very much about the emerging technologies that you might be sharing with allies and partners because it implies those technologies will be extremely valuable to their uh, security and to maintaining peace and stability in the Asia Pacific. I've got 33 people on the list, a couple of people still waving uh, their hands, but it's inevitable in a session like this, especially with the US Secretary of Defense there will be more questions than time available to answer them. Be reassured that I will find you for the next session. But for the meantime, please uh, thank uh, Secretary Austin uh, for his uh, plenary address to the Shangri-La Dialogue. Thank you very much.